So this is math 175, calculus one. So it's the beginning of the calculus sequence. Um, most people will take calc one and calc two, and some people will take calc three, which is vector calculus, which is a very good course. And at Lehman, we've started to teach, or we've been teaching for a couple of years, years calculus using uh, Pearson's MyLab system. There is a textbook, uh, which you do not have to buy. In fact, you don't need to buy it at all. Uh, one thing, calculus textbooks are always ridiculously overpriced, but the calculus book is online in my lab. So you can see it and download it and whenever you need it. Um, calculus books tend to cost about $150 or more. Uh, my lab, I think, costs about $80 to sign up. And when you've signed up, it's good for two years. So you can use it also for Math 176 and Math 226, Calc 3. Uh, so you don't need to pay any more after that. But even $80 is a lot cheaper than having to buy a textbook. Um, all of your homeworks are on my lab. Um, but the midterm and the final exam are not. They're regular exams. Uh, all of these lectures, classes will be on Zoom, but the midterm and the final are given uh, in person on campus, just like a normal exam, pencil and paper, and you solve the problems. And uh, the departmental policy is that uh, you must pass the final to pass the course, uh, but your course grade is an average of your homework, your midterm, and your final. Uh, the uh, online homework problems are uh, very well organized uh, and you can do them at your own pace. And uh, if you make a mistake, you can correct it. And uh, most people get a very good grade on their My Love homeworks because they have a lot of uh, time and opportunity to get everything right. Um, So the general syllabus of the course is, the departmental syllabus is posted on Blackboard. You have to have access to Blackboard. All course announcements uh, are made via Blackboard. Uh, if I have to send out um, um, an email, it's via Blackboard. And it goes to whatever email address Blackboard has for you, which in almost all cases is your Lehman College email address but you are responsible for having access to your email uh, and, to, and to going to Blackboard occasionally or frequently to make sure there are no uh, recent announcements. <clears throat> when there is an announcement, it's always posted. Uh, you always get an email about it in any case. Pretty simple. Uh, does anyone have any questions before we start? So, let me see if I can go to the My Lab website and textbook. That'd be kind of interesting. So let's see where it is. So I will share the screen and go to Pearson. Uh -huh. So you should see the calculus book uh, by Biggs, Cochran, Gillette, and Schultz. And what we cover in this course um, we start with a very quick pre-calculus review. And then the first topic is limits. So because this is really just a quick review day and um, we're experimenting with this system. If you're taking Math 175, uh, I guess you might have taken pre-calculus at Lehman using my lab, uh, or it might be new to you if you have it. Uh, so let's just take a look. So 
Let me go ahead to um, see if I can find it's very slow. Okay, so here's where we're starting. And uh, today I'm going to do, I'm just going to run over, survey the topics in chapter one, which is a pre-calculus review. And then we will start limits. And limits is the first serious subject in calculus. Calculus is a part of mathematics, which is called analysis, mathematical analysis. And the key idea in everything is the idea of a limit. Um, so the most important limit in this class is the derivative. That's the subject of chapter three. Um, very, very, very important. And we will spend a lot of time with derivatives uh, and their applications. <clears throat> and then at the end of the semester, the last couple of weeks, we introduce the second basic tool in calculus, which is integration. So there is the derivative of a function and the integral of a function. Those are the two main topics in calculus, and that's what we spend all our time doing. Uh, mostly derivatives, a little bit integration. And then in second semester calculus, math 176, uh, it's basically all integration and a little bit of what are called differential equations and sequences in infinite series. And if you go on to the third semester of calculus, which is vector calculus, you begin to study these other topics. Um, so that's looking ahead to um, what you might be learning over the next year and a half. So that may No idea what's going on here. Seems my computer feels like going a little bit crazy. Let me uh, stop the share and I'll start it again. See if we have more luck. Uh, let's see. There's some questions in the chat. Are all of the classes going to be online? Yes. Uh, except for the midterm and the final exams. So um, exams. are given in person on campus, uh, Proctor and so forth. What is the code for the MyLab course? That's a good question. Um, so, Okay, so let me go to a piece of paper and write this down. Um, so this is Math 175, section H S O two, but the code, the MyLab code, 
might be the following. F-E-R-A 42244. And when I go to look up this section in my lab, I see this magic number appearing and that might be the code. So uh, if it's not, let me know either as in the chat right now or by email after the class is over. But FERA, F-E-R-A 42244 might be the code uh, for us. Okay, because here, if you see, this is my sign in. This is the course in my lab. And here it says FERA 42244. So maybe that's it. I am using this for Math 175 for the first time. So this Pearson's my lab is also new to me. And if I go into the course, a lot of information comes up. Uh, first couple of assignments, for example. Um, but here there is the static and the interactive ebook. I'm opening the static ebook. E text. Here it is. And let me try to go to page one. Yes, okay. So this is where we're starting today. And I'm just going to really, I'm just going to follow three in the book and talk a little bit about the various topics here. But everything here is supposed to be familiar to you from high school algebra, pre-calculus and so forth. So the most important thing is the definition of a function or the concept of a function. So a function, <coughs> is something that associates to every number in some domain, some set, a new number. So if you call your function f, which is traditional, and your number x, f sends the number x to some new number f of x. And the set of numbers you're starting from is called the domain of the function. And the set of numbers you're going to is called the range of the function. And the standard pretty picture looks like this. Or if you think in terms of computers or machines, you have some machine, which is your function. You input a number x, and you output a number f of x. Right? That's the function. And then x is called the independent variable, and y is called the dependent variable. That's simple enough. And then the key, so a simple example of a function is f of x equals x squared minus 2x. So if you let x equal 1, f of 1 would be 1 squared minus 2 or minus 1. If you let f equal minus 1, you'd have minus 1 squared, which is plus 1, minus 2 times minus 1, which is plus 2. So f of minus 1 will be 3 and so forth. And again, the key fact of a function, you usually draw the graph of a function in terms of the x and y axes. So for every value of x, you have a value f of x. And it's unique. For every number x, there's just one value. <clears throat> so if you have the graph of a function, you draw a vertical line, it cannot cross the graph of a function in two places. If you have some curve, and it has the property that if it, even one place, a vertical line, cuts the curve in two places, then this is not a function. So this is not the graph of a function. But this very pretty curve is the graph of a function. Because for every x, there's at most one y. So a vertical line cuts this curve in at most one place. And that is all that's called the vertical line test. Right. And I'm running through this, if there are any questions, just unmute yourself, interrupt, and ask. Do not hesitate. Um, and don't put it, a question into the chat because I won't see it. Okay. So domain and range of a function, they're pretty straightforward. Um, 
What's also extremely important is the idea of a composite function. So this occurs when you have two functions, say f and g. And you can start with a number x and compute g of x. So that's another number. And you can apply f to g of x and you get the number f of g of x. So applying first g and then f, that is, that is following one function with another function creates what is called the composite function, g composed with f, or f composed with g in this case, f composed with g. So g sends x to g of x, and f sends g of x to f of g of x. And that's the kind of picture that you have. And again, um, composite functions are things that are described in detail because they're used all the time. They're very important. Now, <clears throat> we typically represent functions by their graphs. Um, and there's an important operation that we do in calculus, which we can see right here. So here we have this picture and there's a function f of x. And the dark line is the graph of f of x. So if you take a point x, <clears throat> the point p on the curve has coordinates x comma f of x. Right, f of x is the value of the function at x. Now, suppose you move a little bit to the right by an amount h. So you go from x to x plus h. And there is the point on the curve, f of x plus h. So as x goes from x to x plus h, the function goes from f of x, that's the height p, to f of x plus h, which is the height q. And you can draw a line connecting, a straight line connecting the points p and q. So that line, a line connecting two different points on a curve is called a secant line. And that secant line has a slope. For a straight line, what is the slope? It's the rise over the run. It's the difference in the x coordinate divided by the difference in the so the difference in the y coordinate divided by the difference in the x coordinate. Or if you like, the change in y divided by the change in x. Now, the change in y from x to x plus h is f of x plus h minus f of x. And the change in x from x plus h to x, if you subtract, you just get h. So this quantity, f of x plus h minus f of x over h, that is the slope of the secant line. And that's a very, very important quantity in calculus, the slope of the secant line. And this expression, f of x plus h minus f of x over h, the numerator is the difference. And then you're dividing by h, so you get a quotient. So this formula for the slope is called a difference quotient. So you'll see that language being used a lot in calculus. Oh. And one interpretation of this is, as you go from x to x plus h, the function increases by this amount, f of x plus h minus f of x, as x goes through it, an amount h. So this quotient is sort of like the average change in the function. Oh. So another interpretation of the slope of a secant line is the average rate of change of the function f in the interval from one point to another. And it's straightforward to do some calculation. Suppose you take the function f of x equal to 3x squared minus x. So that's a very simple quadratic function. The graph, you know, is a parabola because it's a quadratic with a positive coefficient. It's a parabola that's going up. And <clears throat> you want to calculate the difference quotient and maybe simplify it if you can. 
So f of x plus h here, you see with this blue line above it, that's f of x plus h. And f of x is just 3x squared minus x divided by h. That's the difference quotient. If you want to simplify it, well, we do. So <clears throat> you have to expand all this, collect the terms, divide by h. And this rather ugly looking expression simplifies into simply 6x plus 3h minus 1. Now, to get from here to here, you use a little bit of algebra. If you don't know algebra, you can't do this, and then you're going to be in trouble throughout the whole course. That is, you have to know algebra. Algebra is a prerequisite. Pre-calculus, high school algebra is a prerequisite for calculus. So if you're having trouble doing the algebra, um, you need to go to the tutoring center in the for mathematics, uh, there's a student help center on the second floor of Gillette where they are very, very good at helping you uh, fill in gaps that you might have had before you got into the calculus class. But the algebra you have to know. And I strongly recommend you take advantage of the tutoring center uh, where they have people who know the calculus very well. It's always nice to know something that uh, conveys a lot of information about a graph. And one thing which one always looks for in mathematics uh, is symmetry. So here on this curve in figure 1.13, this curve is symmetric around the y-axis. What that means is if you were to rotate this curve, around the y-axis by <clears throat> pi radians or 180 degrees, you get back the same curve. So this curve <clears throat> has a kind of vertical symmetry, a symmetry around the y-axis. This curve does not have this a vertical symmetry. Have a vertical. Sorry, is there a question? So this curve does not have a vertical symmetry, but it has a horizontal symmetry. It has a symmetry around the x-axis. If you were to rotate this through the x-axis, you get back exactly the same curve. So this has a horizontal or x-axis symmetry. This curve is not symmetric about the y-axis. If you rotate it around the y-axis, you get something different. It's not symmetric around the x-axis. If you rotate it around the x-axis, you get something different. But it is symmetric around the origin. What that means is you take a point on the curve, you draw the straight line to the origin, and you continue the same distance, and you get back on the curve. So this is this curve is symmetric around the origin. And that is a very useful. Oh, sorry. Uh, I've been clicking S to unmute. What I really mean is everyone should be muted. So don't unmute if I just made the mistake and asked you to do that. That seems to be a little bit better. OK. Um, but if you do have a question, unmute yourself and ask. Uh, don't hesitate to interrupt at any time. <clears throat> so symmetry is important. Um, and the more mathematics you do, the more important uh, it becomes. Um, let's see. Um, there's a lot of information about functions, but 
I want to just go to some of the most important functions that we use in calculus and that you should be familiar with from pre-calculus. <clears throat> and these are especially the exponential and logarithmic functions and then the trigonometric functions. So an exponential function is a function of the form b to the x. So b is a number, the base, which is positive always and different from one. Because if you take one and raise it to a power, you always get one. Um, uh, but if you take a number like two, two to the x is a basic exponential function. Um, this is a kind of, uh, well, here, this bottom line, the black line is y equal two to the x. If you increase the base, your function gets bigger faster. So the red line is three to the x. This greenish line is five to the x. And this another sort of greenish line is 10 to the x. The larger the base, the bigger the faster, the faster the function increases. If you take a number and raise it to the zeroth power, you always get one, right? Uh -huh. We're always going to look at positive bases. We're never going to look at a negative base. If your base is bigger than one, the more powers you take, the bigger it becomes. If your base is negative, then your function is decreasing. So here's an example where the base B is between zero and one, strictly between. For example, one half. If you take one half to the X, which is one over two to the X or two to the minus X. And again, you have to know the rules of exponents. The graph of one half to the X, well, one half is the same as 0 0.5. It's this red line. If you make the base smaller, function okay, looks like this. Make the base bigger, looks like that. So when the base is between zero and one, the exponential function is what we say, what we call exponentially decreasing. And the most important exponential function uses the number e, which is approximately 2.718, but it is along with pi, uh, one of the two most important numbers in mathematics. Um, uh, and e to the x is the basic exponential function. When we learn about derivatives, you will see why e to the x is so special. Okay. So we have all these exponential functions. There's also the notion of an inverse function. So let's see if we can have a picture of something which has an inverse. It's like, um, well, you can think of it like this. Um, a function f takes x to some number f of x. And the inverse function will take f of x and send it back to x, right? So here's one way to draw this. You take a number x, f sends x to y, f inverse, which is written as f with a superscript minus one, sends y back to x. So the composite function, x to y to x is just the identity function, the composite function f inverse composed with f of x is always equal to x. And that is the property of, a, of an inverse function. If you apply a function and then it's inverse, you're always back to where you start exactly. Not every function has an inverse. If you take a function like y equal x squared, two goes to two squared, which is four, but minus two goes to minus two squared, which is also four. So if you want to send four back to where it comes from, you have two choices, two and minus two. You don't know which, it is, which to choose. And the inverse function in that case is not a function. Inverses occur only for functions that are one-to-one. -one. That means if x goes to y, no other number x gets sent to the same y. And one way to see that graphically is by what's called the horizontal line test. If you have the graph of a function, 
if a horizontal line hits the graph in just one place, then the function has an inverse, as in this graph. And if you have a graph and a horizontal line hits the function in more than one place, there's no inverse. So this cubic curve has no inverse. This function does have an inverse. Again, this is all somewhat abstract at the moment because we're just reviewing some basic concepts, but that's the idea. Now, the inverse of an exponential function is a function called the logarithm. So if you have the exponential function, y equals b to the x, given every number x, you get a number b to the x. The logarithm reverses that. The logarithm says, given the number, b to the x, how do you find x? Uh, so what that means is that the logarithm of x to the base b is a number which has the property that b to that number equals x. Uh, so here is an expression of this statement. y is the log of x to the base b means exactly that b to the power y equals x. That's the definition of the logarithm. And the most important logarithm is associated with the most important exponential function. The most important exponential function is, is when the base is the number e. And in that case, the logarithm is called the natural logarithm. And in this book, it's denoted ln. So normally, if you're given a logarithmic function, it's, there's always this b that's written, log subscript bx. That means the log of x to the base b. But if the base is e, you have the natural logarithm. You just you write y equals ln x, and that means the logarithm to the base e. And you will have learned in pre-calculus various um, properties of the exponential of function and of the logarithm, and um, you're expected to know them. OK. Any questions about this? I'm running through this quickly, because this is all supposed to be a kind of uh, pre-calculus review. So we have the exponential function, the logarithmic function. We also have the six trig functions and their inverses. Now, in calculus, we measure angles in radians. We do not measure angles in degrees. So we never talk in calculus about, a, we never say a right angle is 90 degrees. It is. Um, but that's not the measure that you need in calculus. And if you use degrees in calculus, you'll get all your problems wrong because calculus functions are defined in terms of radians. And a radian, a radian is um, a very physical measurement of an angle. You know, I mean, why is it that a whole angle in traditional, uh, in, in high school math is 360 degrees? Where did 360 come from? It came from the Babylonians uh, 2,500 years ago who had very sophisticated mathematics and they used base 60. Uh, we use base 10 for doing numbers, um, but the Babylonians used base 60. That's why we have 60 seconds in a minute, 60 minutes in an hour, uh, 360 uh, degrees in a circle and so on. That comes from the Babylonian measurement, which was extremely good. And one reason why it was so good was because it's easy to divide. Number 60 has a lot of divisors. So 
if you wanted a fifth of, or let's say uh, uh, a twelfth of 60, that's five. But if you wanted a twelfth of 10 in um, um, the decimal system, that's pretty complicated. Uh, but it's not a natural measure. It's in our, I mean, 60 or 75 or 119, any number can be used as a base of a number system. But, a, uh, uh, but it's not natural. What is natural is uh, radian measure. So in radian measure, the way you measure an angle is as follows. You take a circle of radius one. So the circumference of a circle is two pi r. If the radius is one, the circumference is two pi times one or two pi. If you take an angle theta and you draw it with one side as the positive x-axis and the other side, whatever it is, so here's an angle theta, that angle cuts out an arc of the circle. And the length of that arc is what is called the radian measure of the angle theta. And as you go around the circle, this arc that's cut out goes from zero to the entire circumference, which is two pi. So a whole angle in radian measure is two pi radians. If you take a right angle, you've gone a fourth away around the circle. A fourth of two pi is pi over two. So the radian measure of a right angle is pi over two. And we only use radian measure in calculus, only. Um, if you have an acute angle, uh, you can draw a triangle with that acute angle is this angle. I'm drawing this right triangle with the acute angle at the lower left. And you must remember the definitions of the six trig functions. So the sine is the opposite, the length of the opposite sine over the hypotenuse. It's a ratio. If you enlarge the triangle, the opposite side gets bigger, the hypotenuse gets bigger, but the relative size, which is the ratio, stays the same. So the sine is opposite over a hypotenuse. If you call this x, this y, and this r, then sine is y over r, cosine x over r, tangent y over x. <coughs> and the inverses of these, uh, literally inverse, the inverse of the tangent y over x is x over y, that's the cotangent. And the secant is r over x, and the cosecant is r over y. Those are the six trig functions. And you have to know the values of these for the fundamental angles. These are the fundamental angles. It looks like a lot, but they're really just three, right? I mean, you know that you can see by looking the sine of zero is zero and the cosine of zero is one. The three basic angles <laughs> are pi over six radians or 30 degrees, pi over four radians or 45 degrees, pi over three radians or 60 degrees. And on the unit circle, these are the coordinates of the points of intersection of this ray. And the first coordinate is the cosine, and the second coordinate is the sine. So these are the three numbers you have to know. And in fact, they're really just two numbers because pi over six and, and pi over three, they're reciprocal. They're just the x and y's are interchanged. So for pi over six, you have root three over two and a half. For pi over four, it's just root two over two. The sine and the cosine are the same. And if you look at the corresponding angles in the first, second, third, and fourth quadrants, it's the same number as an absolute value, it's just the sine changes. So in the second quadrant, the cosine is negative and the sine is positive. In the third quadrant, the cosine and the sine are both negative. In the fourth quadrant, the cosine is positive and the sine is negative. Again, these are the basic facts that you absolutely positively have to know. And you also need to know
it's basically trig identities. Right? If the tangent is the sine over the cosine, the cotangent is one over the tangent of the cosine over the sine. And the fundamental identities, which we use all the time, sine squared plus cosine squared equals one. And then in terms of tangents and so forth, tangent squared plus one is secant squared, cotangent squared plus one is cosecant squared. And we have double angle formulas, sine two theta is two sine theta cosine theta and cosine two theta is cosine squared minus sine squared, right? So, You have to go through this chapter very carefully and review all of this material from pre-calculus. Here are the graphs. Here, the red is the graph of the sine. <coughs> the cosecant is the reciprocal of the sine. So where the sine is zero, the cosecant would be infinite. Where the sine is one, the cosecant is one. So the red is the graph of the sine and the blue the graph of the cosecant. Similarly, in this graph, the red is the graph of the cosine, and the reciprocal is the secant, and that's the blue. And here we have the tangent, and here we have the cotangent. So these are the six trig functions, sine, cosine, tangent, cotangent, secant, cosecant. Waves are very important. Sines and cosines are examples of wave functions. I mean, it literally looks like a wave going up and down and up and down and up and down. And you can make the wave bigger, <clears throat> which means changing the amplitude. Uh, and you can also shift the wave. Uh, so you have what's called a phase shift. Uh, and you can also move the whole thing up and down, which is a vertical shift. Um, but if you spend any time studying physics or chemistry, especially in physics, <clears throat> lots of things move like waves, light waves, sound waves. Um, and these trigonometric functions are extremely important in applications. There are also the inverse trig functions, arc sine, arc cosine, and so forth. And, um, they need to be reviewed. Okay. Uh, so what I've just done is gone over the entire review chapter, chapter one of the text. And the first homework problems involve questions on functions of this sort. Um, and you really need to spend a lot of time making sure <clears throat> that your uh, technical skills, your algebraic skills are um, in good shape. You know, you can think of this as uh, an athlete and you have to warm up before um, a game or before a really hard practice and you do your warm up exercises. So in calculus, your warm up exercises are maybe pre calculus. Uh, that's what you have to do to be ready to do calculus well. Let's see, let me stop the share here. Uh, okay. So that's where we are today. Um, oh, someone told me in the uh, chat that uh, the my lab code I gave was correct. And I will put this on Blackboard and email it out to everyone just to make sure everyone has it. Um, that's good. So we're gonna quit for today because we've done what we have to do. And most of what you do learning Calc 1 is actually 
working exercises on the MyLab uh, website. So uh, that's good. Uh, I will post, I will have, I'm going, I have um, the equivalent of office hours. I don't call it office hours because I'm not sitting in an office, but problem sessions on Zoom and there'll be several problem sessions every week. I will make sure I have one uh, uh, on Friday, maybe even tomorrow. So if you're working problems in this pre-calculus review and you have questions, you're welcome to log in uh, and ask. You don't need to let me know in advance. Uh, I will be on Zoom. Um, so if I have a, a Zoom problem session at 10 o'clock, that means at 10 o'clock I log into Zoom. And if you have questions, you log in and ask. And uh, if there are a lot of questions and it has to run more than an hour, I'm happy to stay unless I have another class. Um, but if I log in at 10 o'clock and no one's there and I'm sitting there looking at the computer screen for half an hour and no one has logged on with any questions, I will say, uh, I guess there are no questions today and I have other work to do. Um, so it's not that I'm sitting, uh, uh, around for the whole, for an hour. It's whatever. I'm there as long as there are questions, but I disappear if there aren't any questions. If you have questions and there's not a scheduled problem session, send me an email and I can set up a time that is convenient for you. Uh, that's no problem. So if I have a problem session, but you're not able to come at that time and you have some questions you want to ask about the material, about homework, whatever, uh, just send me an email and we can arrange a, a session on Zoom that works. Okay. Any questions to, uh, before we quit for the morning? Um, good morning. I have a question. Sure, go ahead. Um, do we have to memorize the unit circle? I'm sorry, do what? Do we have to memorize the unit circle? Um... Yes. I mean, when you're doing uh, the homework problems on my lab, of course, you can always just look it up. But when you're taking an exam, the midterm and the final on campus, and you're not, you're not allowed to use a computer or notes, you should know it. And just in general, there are really just two or three angles you have to know. Pi over three, pi over four, pi over six. So that's not a lot, and you really should know them. So the answer is yes, you should memorize. But once you know those angles in the first quadrant, it's easy to figure out the angles in the second, third, and fourth quadrants. It's just a matter of changing the plus and minus signs appropriately. So the answer is yes, you do have to know it. OK, thank you. OK. Other questions? Hello. Um do we have any assignments on my lab for right now? Oh, yeah. The assignments for this semester are there. The whole semester. And they all, okay. Do we have due dates or do we do them like whenever so, we can? Um, that's a good question. Um, on the website, it says it's all due on the same day. Right. No, no. The way the website was set up, it's all due the last day of the semester. So you don't have to get like these messages saying your homework is late, your homework is late. So <clears throat> you have to be responsible and be doing homework constantly um, or you'll do badly in the course. But so, for example, you should be able to do the first assignment right now. Um, and but so so ignore the due date. The due date just means it has to be done by the end of the semester, but really you should be doing it uh, uh, at the same schedule as the lectures that we're giving here. So, uh, so the assignments that involve pre-calculus, you should start to do now. Uh, on Monday, I will begin to talk about limits and you should be doing the assignments with limits, but there's not, but the, the, the semesters, uh, all the, the assignments for the semester are uh, set up along with the course. So they're all on Blackboard now, and you can do them now. 
Okay, and one more thing. Um, if we had my lab for pre-calc, like one, like I had math 171 and we use my lab, do I have to pay the $80 again for your course? So what I'm told is that when you sign up for my lab, it's good for two years. So you can use it for more, for all the, any classes you take in those two years. So if okay. you took pre-calculus last semester or last year, you should not have to pay anything else. Okay. But Thank let me you. just say one more thing. Um, mm -hmm. If you have a question about my lab, you should contact the people in the math uh, 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 student help center, the tutoring center in Gillette. They know the details of my lab a lot better than I do. Um, okay. So I don't know anything about, uh, you know, how you register for my lab and how you use it for three semesters or whatever. But if you have a problem, they will be able to help you. Okay. Thank you. Okay. Other questions? Anything else? Okay. The only other bit of advice I have is um, don't fall behind. Uh, calculus, uh, there's a lot to learn in calculus, and there are also a lot of skills to develop. <clears throat> and it can be misleading when you're doing problems online all the time, because you can try them again and again and again. But the main part of your grade comes from the midterm and the final. And those are regular exams in a classroom. And you want to make sure you know the material before you go in to take the exams. Um, so you really have to do a lot of work and keep on schedule. OK. If there are no more questions, then I wish everyone a pleasant day. It looks kind of dreary out there, but still wish you a pleasant day. And uh, next class is next Monday morning. Right. Bye, all. Thank you, Professor. Goodbye. Bye. Have a good day. Thank you. You too. Thank you, Professor.